Hello, I'm David. Um, I'm from the Maths Learning Centre. It's semester one, 2018. This is a revision seminar for probability and statistics two. All right. Now we're going to be talking about more or less random things. Excuse the pun. Um, all right. Probability generating functions. Okay, so um, a random variable is um, comes along with a distribution that tells you what all of the probabilities are for all of the things that happen in your random variable. So we need a random variable first. should call it y because for some reason in this course and in the lecture notes they seem to be y more often than x. So if you have a random variable, um, that means that it has numbers that it produces and um, every number and along with it comes its description of its distribution which is all the things it can be and how likely they are. Um, and there are many ways to describe a distribution. You could you know, <laughs> give someone a name and go oh it's a, it's a binomial distribution with uh, 10 trials and probability of success 0.8 and that should tell people everything they need to know. You can just have a function which tells you what the probability is for each of the numbers um, or we can have this thing called a probability generating function. This is one of the options. Um, I haven't quite figured out why we care um, but I might get there. I have a half an idea so uh, I'll get there when we get there. So random variable y um, and it has to be a discrete random variable. Um, on roughly the integers where the options are that you know 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And then every, ob every number has a probability so we're going to say that the probability that y is equal to the specific value y is f of y. Alright, that's what, how we set it up and then the probability generating function is like a polynomial um, and the coefficients of the polynomial are the probabilities that go with those numbers. So it will be uh, I mean it's this, right? Like that. Okay, so each um, power goes has the go each number that it could that the y could possibly be goes in the power, um, and the probability of being that y goes as the coefficient. Okay, radio. Um, I feel like I need an example. How do you do binomial? Is it BIN or just B? Okay. Okay, and so the probability of each of the numbers, so this is Y and this is the probability that Y is equal to Y. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the probability of 0 will be. Oh gosh. <coughs> okay, so they are the probabilities. Let me just check if they actually add up. Uh, 10 and 10 is 20, and another 5 and 5 is 30. Is it? Okay, cool. 
all adds up to what it's supposed to be. So this is the binomial distribution with five trials and probability of success 0 0.5, and its um, probability generating function is a polynomial capital P apparently. Uh, traditionally Z, whatever. Um, matter. So it'd be 1 on 32, 5 on 32x plus 10 on 32x squared plus 10 on 32x cubed plus 5 on 32x to the 4 plus 1 on 32x to the 5. I mean that, that's the deal. And the thing is that the probability of getting 6 is 0 and so there aren't any more terms. But if I had something that um, whose probability went we know that there was possible to get any number, then um, the probability generating function would go on forever. So uh, let me see if I've got one of those. Uh, dice rolls until until the first six appears, including the roll with the six. There's a name for that distribution. What's that? Uh, hypergeometric? I can never remember if the hypergeometric is traditionally supposed to include the roll when you, the event happens or it only includes the number before it happens. But anyway, I can figure out the probabilities without knowing the formula. So that's obviously zero because I'm including the role where you first get the six, so you can't get zero as your answer. Um, it could happen on the first row, which would happen in one and six. It could happen in the sex roll, sec second row, which would be five on six for the first row to not get a six in the first row and one six for the second row. And this would be five on six for the first row and five on six for the second row and one six for the third row where I got a six. And it looks like I get 5 on 6 to the 3 times 1 on 6. And this should be 5 on 6 to the n minus 1 times 1 on 6. By the look of it, based on my pattern there, 1 less 5 on 6 than the 2, 2 5 on 6s, which is 1 less than 3, 3 5 on 6s, 1 less than 4, 0 5 on 6s, which is 1 less than 1. Cool. And so my probability generating function will be one on six x plus five on six times one on six x squared plus five on six squared one on six x cubed and forever. Because this one goes forever because there's a probability for any number at all. Okay. Cool. Oh, cool. I didn't know this. I didn't see this definition here. Must not have read the whole definition. It turns out that the probability generating function is also the expected value of x to the y. Well, that would be a capital Y, wouldn't it? That's probably why they choose it to be a Z, because X is capital X is often used as a um, as a uh, bloody hell, the name of a random variable. <laughs> Z less common. Oh yeah, that makes sense because you're having X to the power of Y and you're multiplying it by the matching probability and adding them up. That's what expected value would be. Okay. Cool. Okay, so that's cool and lovely, but. How does this help is the good question. So uh, with these generating functions, the idea is that you should be able to, to pick out the probability by pulling out um, the coefficient of the correct power of x or z or whatever it is. And so um, the way that I know of picking out a coefficient of something is to differentiate it enough times and sub in zero. Um, so that's what we do when we did Taylor polynomials back in first year. 
Um, you figure out what the coefficient of the Taylor polynomial is by differentiating enough times, subbing in zero, and then, well, adjusting it by k fac n factorial, depending on what you actually, because every time you differentiate, you multiply by the power. So it would seem to me that if I wanted to get this power here, I could differentiate it uh, once, which would get it down to an x squared, but it would be multiplied by 3. I could differentiate it again, which would get it down to an x, but I'd be multiplied by 2. I could differentiate it again, and then this would end up in the constant term. And all the rest of the terms would have x's, so if I sub in x equals 0, it would leave me with just that number. But it would end up being multiplied by 3 times 2 times 1. Um, so I need to divide by that to get the correct probability. So um, basically this is saying, so some... The probability that y is equal to y is the yth derivative of px with x equals 0 subbed in. Right, Seems like a waste of effort considering we had to figure out the probabilities in order to create this polynomial. But I have a feeling that with some of the distributions that are familiar, it will be possible to rewrite your polynomial in a different format. Well, it's not really a polynomial. Because it might be the Taylor series for something. Or a Maclaurin series for something. Actually, it would be a Maclaurin series. It might be a Maclaurin series for something, which means that you might be able to rewrite it um, as something else. In fact, I reckon I could redo that hypergeometric in, in a different format and it would be easier to do derivatives and stuff. Right, your other fact is that the... Exp yes, it totally will. Well done. I went to all the effort of explaining that and then I didn't say it when I wrote down the formula. Yeah. So I believe in your lecture notes it's written as this derivative is equal to that times y factorial. But this makes me feel better because it tells me something I wanted to know. All right, and the other thing would be that I reckon I could get the expected value out because the expected value would be each probability multiplied by its matching number. So if I differentiated this once, then I'd get a 1 on 6 times 1. But I changed the... What, how, how do I do that? That's weird. I change... This would get multiplied by 2. This would get multiplied by 3. So if I differentiated it, everything would get multiplied by its matching probability. And so in order to add them all up, I'm going to need to actually not put x equals 0. I'm going to need x equals 1 so that everything's times 1 and therefore I add them all up. So it looks like the expected value of y is going to be p dashed of 1. Now that's useful. And there's this other thing in the notes that I'm going to just... Um, there's this other thing here, which is, you know, a thing... Um, yeah. If you differentiate it enough times, it's the expected value of that thing times whatever. So I'm just going to write that down. There's this general version. The expected value of y times y minus 1 up to y minus k minus 1 is the kth derivative evaluated at 1. which I imagine could conceivably help you figure out the variance. Because um, the variance involves an expected value of y squared. So if I did that, which would be the second derivative, I'd get an expected value of y squared and an expected value of y, and I already know what the expected value of y is from the first derivative. So that would tell me, the, yep, that would work. I could do that. OK. Cool. So they look like things that are useful. And this is nice because if I can rewrite my probability generating function in a different format, then I might be able to differentiate it more easily. 
So we want an example. Um, well, let me do that one I did before. See, I noticed that I can probably, if this was a cubed, I could bring it inside the x cubed there. So if I just multiply everything by 5 on 6, um, that's going to give me something nice. I should really have written this as a sum, but I'm committed now. Do you know what? Let's. We started at one, really, didn't we? Okay. And that's good, I can do that one. So if I add up infinitely many powers of the same of thing, that's a geometric series and there's a formula for the sum of a geometric series. Um, but that formula starts at zero, so um, I want to deal with that. If I started at 0, 5 and 6 to the x to the power of um, 0 would be 1. So, if, But I didn't start at 0, I started at 1, so I need to take that off. And that's how you do the sum of a geometric series. So if you start at 0, it's 1 over 1 minus 5 and 6 to the x. 1 over 1 minus the thing that's got the powers. Cool. Uh, hmm. I'm going to just multiply this top and bottom by 6. It would be cool if it was a single... F no, I'm going to leave it like that. And so my px was 5 sixths of this, so I'm going to have to... Times by 6 over 5. There we go. Beautiful. That is a formula for that, that thing. The reason I write that is because I'm going to have to differentiate it, so that's going to be easier. Okay. It might not be the best formula for this, but um, I suppose a different way of doing it could have been to have a 1, switch this to 0 and put a plus 1. Yeah, this is fine. All right. Cool. So, the expected value should be the derivative of this with uh, one sub into it. Let's see. And the one fifth is a constant multiplied on, so it'll still be there. This six is a constant multiplied on, so it'll still be there. And we have thing to the power of minus one. Uh, but I have to multiply the by minus five because of the chain rule, and the derivative of minus one is zero. Okay, so this 5 cancels out that 5, that's cool. 
this minus cancels out that minus. So I've got Okay, so p dashed of 1 is 6 times 6 minus 5 times 1 to the negative 2. Which. Oh crap, there were two 6s. No, they weren't. It's alright. I was wrong. Which is not giving me the answer I expect. I oh, know it is. Good. I actually just said that in my head that 5 times 1 was 0, <laughs> and that would give me a completely different answer. But 5 times 1 is 5, and 6 minus 5 is 1, and 1 to the power of minus 2 is and 6. And you would expect, since a die, you know, the, the number of 6 happens 1 in 6 times, that it would take 6 rolls to get it, on average. So good, we are, we are working out well, so that really is the expected value of y. And the world's working the way it ought to. All right. So my second derivative, just to make sure I've got this, I'm doing this right. Six is multiplied on, it'll still be there afterwards, times by the minus two, minus three, times by the minus five, because of the chain rule. So that's 60. Okay, so p double dashed of 1 is 60, which is 60. I'm not going to make the same mistake again. And so the expected value of y times y minus 1 should come out to p double dashed of 1, which is 60, according to the rule that I used before. So let's see, the expected value of y squared minus y. The expected value of y, y minus 1 is the expected value of y squared minus y, which is the expected value of y squared minus the expected value of y, which we figured out was 6. So this is 60, and this is 6. So the expected value of y squared is 66, and so therefore the variance of y which is the expected value of y squared minus the expected value of y squared. Is 66 minus 6 squared. Which is a disturbingly round number, but I'm sure it's okay. So if we go and look up the formula for the variance for the hypergeometric, it should come out right. I've done this correctly. I wonder where that would be. Was probability generating functions before or after the description of various different uh, discrete distributions? You know what? I'm just going to Google it. Wikipedia for this. Wrong one? Is this really the hypergeometric? Or is this just geometric? Probability of X Bernoulli trials to get one success supported on the set 1, 2, 3. That's the one I've got. And this is the formula I had. is 1 minus p over p squared. 
All right, we're just going to check if it comes out right. Should be that the variance of y is 1 minus p over p squared, where p is the probability of our event happening, which is 1 in 6. So 5, 6 divided by 1 over 36. If I multiply everything by 36, 5, 6 times 36 over 1, which is 5 times 6, which is 30. Yay! Right, the world makes sense again. Yay. Okay, good. That's kind of cool. So the fun bit would be if you did this in terms of P, right? Where they went, well, you know, consider a, a Bernoulli trial with probability P and, you know, how many successes, how many um, trials it takes to get whatever, and you should be able to do all of this with P instead of 1 and 6. Um, and it should all still work out, because this bit here should work perfectly well with a 1 minus P in that spot. Do you want me to do that with the general one? Just to see how it works out? I might... Um, I just want to see how it works with general one. What if was p and not 1 over 6? In which case, my probability distribution function, uh, generating function, would have worked out to be The sum y equals 1 to infinity of p times 1 minus p to the y. Right. Minus 1. Okay, and so I could do the same trick that I did with the other one and multiply everything by 1 minus p. And then the same thing would have happened. Oop, that would be an x. And then cool, and that's still a geometric series. So I'll get one over one minus one minus px minus one, like we did before. Because that's what it would be if it started at y equals zero, but it actually starts at y equals one. So I have to take off the one when y is zero. Okay, and so we would attempt to rewrite that and see what we get. That's awful. Yeah. Well, let's just see what happens. Oh, so my PX. Let's see what my derivatives come out to be. P dashed x. The p on 1 minus p is a constant. It's multiplied on, so it'll still be there. This will be minus 1, minus 2. But because of the chain rule, I have to multiply by minus 1 minus p. Sure. And then the derivative of the 1 is 0. Yep, that's all working good. And so I get that minus cancels that minus. The divide by 1 minus p cancels the times by 1 minus p. Which is exactly what we got. 
Not quite. What did we get? Something else. Sorry? Oh, that's PX. Oh, cool, yep. Good, good, good. Um, where's my derivative? Lost a page. I've lost a page. Yes, because I would divide everything by six in there and that would all work out fine. Okay, good. Okay, and so... My second derivative... P would still be there. I'll get a minus two, one minus one minus P. X minus three times a minus one minus P. So I've got a P minus P. <coughs> Alright. So let's see how that works out. So the expected value of Y is P dash 1, which is P times 1 minus 1 minus P times 1. is p times now. 1 minus 1 minus p is just p. So that's p on p squared, which is 1 on p. Oh yeah, that makes sense. 1 on 1 on 6 is 6. Good O. And the expected value of y times y minus 1 is p double dashed at 1, which is p times 1 minus p times P times 1 minus P times P is a minus 3, which is 1 minus P on P squared. So the expected value of Y squared minus Y. The expected value of Y squared times Y. The expected value of Y squared minus 1 on P. So cool. So the expected value of y squared plus which is 1 minus p on p squared plus p on p squared, which is just 1 on p squared. That's so cool. It feels cool to me anyway. No, this is going to come out to zero. What's the, what the hell has happened? Oh, before we do just a second, I totally missed a two, didn't I? <sighs> yes, because of course the minus cancels out the minus, but not the two. Good oh, well done. I think I've tracked where everything, where my two went. Okay. So the variance for y should be expected value of y squared minus the expected value of y squared. Nope, minus. which is 1 minus p on p squared. Oh, okay. Good. Everything works. Yay. So you see what I did there? You know, good, good learning lesson. I went, oh my goodness, if I figure this out the way it is, my, expect my variance is going to come out to zero, and that's not going to be correct. 
and so I've done something wrong. So at least it told me something that happened that went wrong. I wouldn't be doing my job as the Maths Learning Centre lecturer correctly if I didn't point out general learning skills like that. Of course, I'm not following one of the most important general skills, which is numbering your pages. Okay. So I think that's enough of that. Um, except for there was a, like a question uh, that I might as well do just to round it out. No, that's MCC. Okay. And the question goes. Why Why is discrete uniform with outcomes 1 to n? Okay? And then a What is the probability generating function for y? And b find the expected value of y and the variance of y. Okay. So, being discrete uniform with those outcomes, that means that every outcome is equally likely, so the probability of each one is 1 on n. So the probability of that y is equal to y is 1 on n for y equals 1 to n. Might switch over to Z for this one. <coughs> Mix it up a bit. So the probability generating function will be 1 on 6x plus 1 on 6x squared plus 1 on 6x to the n. Not 6n. I'm thinking of a die in my head, which is your classic discrete uniform. Right. Much better. And it would be much easier to do this if I could rewrite this in a format that was simpler. And so um, I am going to rewrite it, and at least pull out the 1 on n x. Like that. Because that's they all share that term. And uh, 1 plus x plus all the way up to x minus to the n minus 1 is this. Useful thing to know. Or alternatively, with a 1 minus, it doesn't matter. Um, the traditional way of writing it is this way. I'm going, to put, I'm going to leave it as this one, but it could have been... It could have been that, because um, if x was less than 1, then when the x to the n went to infinity, that would go to 0 and you get 1 over 1 minus x which is why the, the geometric series thing works. So, all right. And that, that's not too bad. Though it's, it's not very easy to differentiate, <laughs> sadly. Don't really like that very much. Oh, anyway, but that's what it is. All right, well, let's give it a go. Oh, I did it as X's anyway, didn't I? Sorry. I promised to do it as Z's and then I couldn't be, then I just didn't. I, I have trouble even doing complex numbers with Z's. I, I still do them with X's uh, when I've got polynomials of complex numbers. <coughs> well, that's all product and quotient rule Yeah, I don't like that at all. Maybe it would have been easier to do the derivative with the original. No. What the hell? It's 
So this one, it looks like it's easier to differentiate this one than this one. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to use the original. This wasn't necessary, but it's still, use, still interesting. So let's see. That's the first derivative. And the second derivative is left of 1 is 1 on n plus 2 on n plus n on n which is 1 plus 2 plus on n and that's half of n n plus 1 because that's what you get when you add up 1 to n that's half of n times n plus 1 which is half of n plus 1 that makes sense. Um, you'd expect um, for a uniform distribution for the, the mean to be somewhere in the middle, and that's the average of all those numbers. And I know, in, I know already that the, the, the mean of a dice roll is three and a half, which works because uh, you know six plus one over two is three and a half. That, that's great. Okay. That not so much. Uh, it might be easier to write it as a sum. I've included, um, I know mine starts at 2, but I've included the, the y equals 1 and the y equals 0, y equals 1 and the y equals 2, um, because the first one's 0 anyway, so that worked out like that. Okay. Oh, of course. Oh, my usual sums start at zero. No, they don't. They start at one. That's okay. That's just a geometric series that starts at zero. All right. So this one is n cubed on three plus n squared on two plus n on six, and this one is half of n n plus one. There is a factorized version of this, but I can't remember it. This is the one I remember. It might be n, n plus 1, 2n plus 1 on 6. But. Okay. n cubed, n squared on 3, plus n on 2, plus 1 on 6, minus a half of n plus 1. Cancel n squared on 3. Now, uh, sixth minus a half is negative a third because of my favorite fraction fact, which is that uh, a third plus a sixth is a half. Um, and there you go. That's that. Oh, that's not the variance yet, is it? Crap, just a second. It's so satisfying, though. I have a feeling it's going to be like n squared on 12 or something. Okay, so the expected value of y is p dashed of 1, which we figured out was n plus 1 over 2. The expected value of y squared minus y 
is p double dashed of one, which we figured out to be n squared minus one over two. And so therefore the expected value of y squared n over 2 and so the variance of y will be the expected value of y squared minus the expected value of y squared which is n squared plus n over 2 minus 3, 3, sorry ah oh, that's a whole other thing entirely, crap let's just leave it like that It looked too simple, didn't it? So n squared minus 1 on 3 plus n plus 1 on 2 minus n plus 1 on 2 squared. So what's that? n squared plus 2n plus 1 over 4. Oh, look, it is going to have to be over 12 thought so. So times this one by 4, times this one by 6, times this one by 3. So we've got 4n squared minus 3n squared, which is just n squared. So we've got a minus 4, a plus 6, and a minus 3, so the minus 4 and the minus 3 would be minus 7, and 6 minus 7 is negative 1. And we've got a 6n minus a 6n, so they cancel each other out. I wasn't too far off. It was n squared minus 1 on 12, not n squared on 12. Sweet. Cool. So it turns out that this one required us to know some sum notation stuff as well. Now I don't know if that would have been easier to just differentiate this uh, with our, you know, quotient slash product rule. Maybe. It would have gotten worse on the second derivative. So it might have come out to roughly the same amount of work overall. But I don't feel like practicing my derivatives um, today. I really do, though, but you don't feel like me practicing my derivatives in front of you. Okay. Cool. All right, well, there you go. That's probability generating functions, um, which seems to be mainly a way of practicing your sum notation and noticing various facts about both infinite and finite sums. So some useful th sums to know um, in there were, um, you know, these ones, which were mentioned in passing in Maths 1A, and you're, you know, of course have to know them, um, and the geometric series, which was mentioned in Maths 1B. For those of you listening to this in 2019 and beyond, um, I don't know what's in Maths 1B yet because they haven't given me the new curriculum. Yeah. Maths 1A does have. Uh, the the um, these sums in it though, that's good. Yeah, all right. There you go. Probability generating functions. Um, you may have noticed, if you were paying attention, um, that probability in statistics two is full of sum notation. Um, everywhere, distributions and all sorts of things. Okay, so the next thing I was asked about. Um, was um, point slash Poisson processes. And I did some Googling and uh, it appears that a point process is a general idea but the only one that you're told about is a Poisson process. So a point process is something where an event happens in continuous time or space. Just put 
looking for it. So a point process um, is points, so events, happen in continuous time or space. It can be distance as well, so you can do it as, you know, they happen randomly in a space of time from now onwards. Um, you know, on average one every ten minutes. Um, or they can happen along a road, for example, and we'll have one every five kilometres or something like that. Um, and there are various ways to describe the probability of an event happening within a certain amount of time. So there will be a distribution to describe how likely events are. So there's a distribution in time or distance. But the only one that you're told about is the one where this distrib the distribution that describes how many events in a particular time is the Poisson distribution. Um, or the distribution that describes how long until an event is the exponential distribution, same thing. Um, so the only one you're told about is the Poisson process. So Poisson process um, is a point process where the distribution of the number of events <coughs> in fixed time or distance is a Poisson distribution. That's why it's called a Poisson process. And the basic assumption of a Poisson process, as far as I'm aware, is that um, non-overlapping intervals of time are independent. So non-overlapping time or distance intervals are independent and that will cause it um, to be best modelled with a Poisson process. Okay. Alright. So, um, the useful, that's the basic assumption of a Poisson process there, that's extremely important. Um, that's how to tell um, when you're thinking about a particular situation whether a Poisson process as opposed to a general point process is going to do the job. Um, and some useful facts are that if you do have a Poisson process, um, as in a point process where non-overlapping time or distance intervals are independent, then you can describe how many events happen in a fixed time interval with a Poisson distribution and you can describe um, how long it is until an event with a um, exponential distribution. So, in a Poisson process, where events happen um, with rate. You normally use lambda for the rate, don't you? Lambda. Now, is that rate lambda like, like a num? Is that like a if if the rate was lambda, 
if I said the rate was you know five per hour, that's how the lambda normally is, and it would be five. Okay. Okay, lambda per time unit. Okay, good. As opposed to um, the amount of time per event, which is one over lambda. Okay, in a process process where the event ha events happen with a rate of lambda per time unit on average. Um, then the number of events in t units of time is a Poisson. How do you do that? PO, POI? How do you write Poisson distribution? Sorry? Do you? Sure. It doesn't have an abbreviation? What's it called in R? Did you use R in this course? Sorry? Oh, really? Oh, so sad. Sorry? Can't get. Don't get it. Why do they keep changing? Just a second, I'm just looking for the sake of Braille. All right, so it's a Poisson with rate lambda. You only have one disk, you know, yeah, okay. And, oh no, not lambda. It's not how the lambda goes. You put the mean in the Poisson distribution. Lambda times t. So you figure out how many events you would expect to have on average in that time, and that's the mean of your Poisson distribution. I'll do an example so it will make more sense in a second. Um, and the time until the next event is an exponential distribution with rate lambda. And the time until the whatever event has a distribution which I've forgotten the name of. Erlang, Erlang apparently, yes. Thank you. <laughs> the nth event is Erlang with N and lambda. It's precisely what the Erlang distribution is for, modelling that situation. I mean, it's a sum of independent. No, no, it's not actually. That's a whole other thing. Okay. Yeah, it's a sum of independent exponential distributions at the same rate. In much the same way as the chi-squared distribution is a sum of independent norm, standard normals squared. Okay. Cool. So this will make more sense with an example. Let's think of an event. So when I did this with the, um, with the engineering maths 2A student class a couple of weeks ago, we were in uh, Darling West, which has a possum in the ceiling, and I talked about that. But I, I might talk about something different today. What's something that might happen randomly in time or space? Call center is so boring, and it's the one in the lecture. Uh, sorry? Start going supernova. Sure. Why not? That's a very astronomical example. I wish I had more of a like a like a fantasy stupid example. But that'll do. Just a second. Hmm.
You could go boring. Uh, I just want something with some nice numbers. Really? I like the one with notifications you get from social media. Depends on how famous you are, I suppose, as to what the, what the rate is. Um, well, how often do stars go nova? Don't know. One a day? <laughs> no, no, but there's millions of stars. Like, you know, there's infinitely many stars, so... <laughs> one that's observable from Earth. Yeah, let's say one every every two years. A star is observed to go supernova. About once every two years. This is not the same star, just a star somewhere. Okay. So let's make some questions about this. So... In the five-year period... What is the probability of observing, I don't know, four supernovas? Okay, so here's the thing. It happens about once every two years. So in five years, I would expect um, two and a half on average. So, one in two years. So that's about a half per year. So in five years, I expect five times a half, which is five on two supernovas. On average. Okay. So, let X be the number of supernovas in five years. Then, X is modelled with a Poisson distribution with mean 5 on 2. Okay, which means um, the probability of observing four supernovas is this. And how's the probability go? E to the minus five on two. Five on two to the 
4 over 4 factorial. So the mean goes in this position in a Poisson distribution. It's confusing because the, <clears throat> the notes say lambda in this position, in this spot, here. Um, that lambda is actually, there we go. See, I'm doing this thing here, lambda t minus lambda t. Which is whatever it is. I would ask some sort of computer or calculator to tell me that. Five on two to the power of four divided by four factorial, which is zero point one three four to three decimal places. There you go. Cool. 13%. I'm getting exactly four. Of course, if you, I mean, you really want to know what's probably observing at least four, which is a whole other thing. So, probability of. Okay, just be careful when you're looking at these. If the time period changes, then the probability distribution changes. So, probability that x is greater than or equal to 4. Well, that's a bit trickier. This is a discrete distribution. Um, it, huh. That's so cool. You could totally do this with like the Taylor series for e to the x, but you don't have to. Um, so the um, probability that x is greater than or equal to 4, it might be easier to describe this as 1 minus the probability that x is strictly less than 4. Now this is a discrete distribution. It can't be for 3.8 or 3.9 or whatever. The next number down is 3, so this is the same as this. Because it's a discrete distribution. And so I could just go 1 minus the probability that it's 0 minus the probability that it's 1 minus the probability that it's 3, 2 minus the probability that it's 3. I just take them all off. E to the minus 5 on 2, 5 on 2 to the 0 over 0 factorial minus e to the minus 5 on 2. 5 on 2 to the 1 over 1 factorial minus e to the minus 5 on 2, 5 on 2 to the 2 over 2 factorial minus e to the minus 5 on 2, 5 on 2 to the 3 over 3 factorial. There you go. You just have to figure them all out. Um, all right, so then if I wanted to figure out, you know, I've already, you know, how long is it until the next one? So 
Players over supernova today, how long until the next one on average? That's not a probability question, that's an expected value question, but I don't even need the probability distribution to answer that. I can just say, well, they happen once every two years, so two years. Therefore, expect two years. If they happen once every three years, I'd expect to wait three years. If they happen two every three years, I'd expect to wait a year and a half. You go, you do your rate and do one over that. Okay, cool. What's well, probably of waiting at least three years for the next one? All right. Well, there are two ways of dealing with this problem. One is to conceptualize it with a Poisson distribution, and one is to conceptualize it with, a, with an exponential distribution. So I'm going to do both ways, way one. So I could say, well, let x be the number of well, uh, I'm just going to say events, they are supernovas in three years. Then I want the probability of waiting at least three years, it's the probability that the number you observe in three years is zero. But x is a Poisson distribution with mean, well, three over two. They happen every two years, you expect one and a half to happen in three years. And so therefore, the probability that x is equal to zero is e to the minus three on two, three on two to the zero, zero factorial. Which is just e to the minus three on two. Zero point two two three. Okay. So the probability of waiting at least three years is twenty three percent. Way number two would be to do it as an exponential distribution. Let T be the time until the next supernova. In which case, um, the, we want to know the probability of waiting at least three years is the probability that the time is greater than or equal to three. I should say it's measured in years, I should say that, but Just be careful if your rate is measured in months, then your answer will be in months. Um, okay, so T... T is an exponential distribution with rate a half. And so the probability that T is greater than or equal to 3 is E to the minus... Three. So normally you would be interested in the CDF of something, which is the probability of something being less than a number, but um, the exponential distribution has a particularly nice opposite version of that, the 1 minus the CDF. So I'm just going to put a note here. The CDF is, you know, the probability that T is less than or equal to a specific time is 1 minus E to the minus lambda T. And look, that's still e to the minus 3 on 2, which is the same answer we had before.
So there's two different ways of conceptualizing this. So if I wanted to know the probability um, of waiting at most two years, three years, then that can't be done with the plus one distribution. Can it? Yeah, I suppose it can. Because if you wait at most two years, that's the same as not as, as it happening, there being at least one event. Yeah, it does, can be done. Okay, so that's cool. Um, there are ways of doing this that, that do require the, um, the exponential distribution. I mean, you could go like probability of probably waiting it for between two and three years, right? Um, in which case you'd want your probability that two is less than or equal to t, which is less than or equal to three, which can only be conceptualized with the time. Um, you'd have to work very hard to do it as a Poisson distribution. So you could do this this way. You could say, well, it has to be less than three. But we'll take off the bit that less, that's less than two. And this would be one minus e to the minus a half times three. And this would be one minus e to the minus a half times two. So take the one that cancels that, that becomes a plus e to the minus one minus e to the minus. For, for a um, maths lecturer, one of the nice things about the exponential distribution is that it has a formula for its CDF that can be calculated on a scientific calculator, as opposed to like the normal distribution, which doesn't. Um, and so it's great exam fodder because you can actually get people to give you an actual answer. Um, yeah. Any questions about any of this topic? Uh, when Yep. Wrote it out. Uh, does does you observing it today make a difference? No. I'm just going to repeat that so that everyone here and the people in the recording in here can hear it in case you didn't they didn't hear it. So when when you're saying how long until the next one, um, does um, the fact that I observed today make a difference to the answer? And the answer is no, because non-overlapping time periods are independent. I could have observed it five years ago, and now I'm saying to, you know, I observed a supernova five years ago, today, uh, from today, how long until the next one? Same answer. Um, it's similar to the concept that it doesn't matter how many sixes you rolled on a die, the probability that the next one is six is still one in six, um, starting from now. Um, it can change if you're trying to take into account how many have happened so far. So, I've observed three supernovas in the last. No, no, just a second. Crap. I might change my question in a second. I just need to do this one first. I observed three supernovas in the last two years. What's the probability that the next one within the next year. So that answers your question. This is, this is very careful. I'm going, okay, I've observed three. 
in the last two years. What's the probability that the next one happens within the next year? And so in terms of my time, this is three years ago. This is now. This is one year from now. There's three of them here. And I want to know how many there are, whether the next one happens in this zone. These are non-overlapping time intervals, which means they're independent. And so I can just use the time until the next event in this one here and ignore everything that happened before. So let t equal time until the next event, next supernova. t is an exponential distribution with rate a half. And I can do, th do that because um, future time is independent of past time. So the probability that t is less than or equal to one year is the CDF of an exponential distribution, which is whatever it is. trying to think of a question where it won't be independent and that would be when your time intervals overlap. But I need to think of, I can't think of a situation at the top of my head right now. Um, it's more that um, it's more about the information you have. So if you were given, a, if someone told you no, that, I was just going to say, if someone told you that there'd been three so far, um, you know, how long until the next one? Well, we've already cut it into two pieces. But it's more like um, someone's told you that there's been five in the last three years. No, still not a problem. I've just thought, oh, crap. The time intervals have to overlap for you to have to deal with it. Um, I did one last time. It's, it's like the whole thing with the die, you know, you roll a die and I tell you it's even, what's the probability that it's a six and it becomes one in three? Um, it's that sort of thing. You know, I roll, I, I observe for five years, I tell you there's, a, there's at least four, what's the probability that it's seven? Right, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. because you don't know where you are in the time period. So, there have been at least most six supernovas in the last 10 years, but you don't know when. Right? You don't have records of when or how many. Or the exact number. What's the probability? that there have been exactly four. That you have to take things into account. Nope, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. So we have extra information on top of what has normally happened, you know, given this information. Well, of course you have to do it, yeah, okay. So it's not just the probability with a Poisson distribution that there's four, I have to take into account the fact that I know there's at most six. And so it's like, let x be equal to the number of supernovas in 10 years, then x is a Poisson <coughs> with mean five, 
because there's half a, you know, one every two years, so expect there to be five. What I want is the probability that x is equal to four given that x is less than or equal to six. And that will make a difference because I've got two bits of information about the same time period. All right. Um, but this is within that, and so I should be able to just do the classic conditional probability. And that's the probability that x is equal to 4 and x is less than or equal to 6 over the probability that x is less than or equal to 6. And being less than or equal to 4 and less than or equal to 6 is just the same as being equal to 4. Not that I want to calculate this, that's going to take me a bugger. Because um, this one's going to be e to the minus 5, 5 to the 4 over 4 factorial on the top. And this one's going to be e to the minus 5, 5 to the 0 over 0 factorial plus. And whatever that is, that's the answer. It's a conditional probability. Just going to look something up. Yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing that I did um, in the other seminar, so that's good. So, just wanted to point out that if it's very clear about the fact that you know some information about time period and then you have extra, you want to know the probability of some other information, then, it's, then it isn't independent. But if you know what happened before and you want to know what's happened next, the before doesn't make any difference. Cool. Just want you to be... Beware of the toast. I don't want to say it never makes a difference when you're doing Poisson distributions. All right, any other thoughts about these kinds of processes? Cool. All right. Well, I still have... 25 minutes. So what am I going to talk about? Bivariate distributions. Okay. And what do we want to know about bivariate distributions? I will find the section of the notes that mentions them and um, have a quick thought. So, sorry? Sorry? Ah! Look at that. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Alright. Okay, right, by variant distributions. Okay, um, when, all right, so let me just think about this. So far in the course up until this point, there have been lots of distributions um, of a single number and you have a description of what the probability of that number is. Um, but you have talked way at the beginning about probabilities that were conditional, um, where one event was conditional on another event happening. And that's already secretly a, a thing about two variables. So um, any probability situation can be described with a single Bernoulli variable, which is one if it happens and zero if it doesn't. Um, and when you roll two dice, then there's a bivariate distribution there where one die has a particular number and the other die has a particular number and often you're most interested in the sum of those two which is a single number um, but technically there's already a bivariate distribution there so um, I guess what I'm saying is that two things can happen and you want to know the probability of what all their combinations That is a, supposed to be a full stop. Okay. So I'm just checking something. Checking what I said about bivariate distributions two years ago. Okay. So you want probability of combinations, but you also sometimes want probabilities of one of them happening, um, a specific value of one thing, regardless of what the other thing does. So. I'd also want probably for options for just one thing. Okay. Um, and so you could ramp this up and you could have like 15 things happening um, and try and create, you know, a 15 variant distribution rather than just a two variant distribution. Um, and they actually do include that in these notes, um, technically. The binomial distribution is already. Um, made of multiple variables added together that are all acting independently of each other. And so the, the, one of the reasons you talk about bivariate distributions is so that you can discuss what happens when you add di two different numbers together. Okay, so uh, for example, um, I could um, have two things happening. Um, I could uh, Second. So I have a deck of cards. I should take out the jokers. And interpret all these numbers as numbers, like ace is one and queen is uh, like 
uh, jack is 11, queen is 12, king is 13, like that. Um, and I could roll a die, and together they would have a joint distribution. Okay, so roll a die. Pull a card out of the deck, and so I could... Pull one out, roll my die, and I've got three, ooh, three and eight. Okay, one of the options, for example. So that's one of the options that could happen when I do this bivariate distribution. Okay, um, and I want to know the probability of every combination of options. So three eight would be different from three uh, ten, uh, and that's the idea. Okay. So in this one, what card I pull out is independent of what die, dice roll I roll. Um, and so um, it should turn out that all of the 13 times 6 options are all the same probability. Okay, so I've got total 6 choices for the die and 13 options for the, for the cards. Um, sorry? Oh, right. I thought you said, wouldn't that be eight? And I was going, <laughs> which number? Yeah. Thank you. I know five times 13, and I was just working my way from there. Um, I don't know why I know five times 13. I know four times 13, because that's the deck, 52. Um, OK, so uh, that's 78. There's 78 actual options, and they should all have the same probability. Okay, so that's one option, okay? This is a bivariate distribution, um, and it's made of two uh, random variables. So I might call this uh, Y1 and Y2, for example. So I'm imagining that there is a variable y1 that, that tells you what the dice <coughs> rolls, and a variable y2, which is the card draw. Um, but I'm not actually interested in them as separately at the moment. I'm interested in what the combinations are. So that's the idea there. But I could have ones. So this is an example where everything's got the same probability. You've got 78 options, and they're all 1 in 78. But I could think of ones where they aren't. You know, I could play a random game where I, where I, um, I roll the die, and then I pick out that many cards, and the number and the maximum of those three cards is um, the number that I write down. So I could do, for example, roll die. that many cards. So the roll die and that's Y1. Choose that many cards and Y2 is the maximum. And in that case they're not all the same probability anymore. So in this case it comes out to uh, 3 and 7, right? All right, but there are some of them that can't happen anymore. Um, that used to happen before, and now they can't. So I can't roll, can't get six one anymore, um, because if I have six cards, they can't all be ones, and so I can uh, I can't get six one anymore. So now some. Some combinations are impossible, e.g. 6-1 is not possible anymore, because you can't... have 
all six being one to get one as a maximum. Um, and they're not all the same probability. Um, so I would say that, oh gosh, I can't give any specific examples. Uh, if I roll a one, um, then the probability is one in 13 for each of those. And if I roll a two, then I get different probabilities for each of the six num each of the 13 numbers. So they're not all the same probability either. So I think that um, it's the probability of one, two, is let's see, we get a one on the fat one, and then we get a two, so that would be that. That's fine. And the probability of uh, two, one, would be to get a two on the first one, and then I need my maximum to be one, which means both of the cards that I pull out have to be one. So I get, uh, I have to get a 1 first, which is 1 in 13, and then I have to get a second one, which is now 3 out of 52. 51, yes, I've removed one of the cards. Which is totally not the same thing. So let me just talk, talk through the thinking for that one. So that was 1, 6 getting two on the die and then to get a maximum of one need both cards to be one and so I get one and 13 for the first one which is an ace and now there's three ones in 51 cards, so 3 in 51 for the second one. That's the explanation for that probability there. And so 1, 2 and 2, 1 don't have the same probability as each other anymore um, because, well, obviously they, we would expect them to do that because what the second number was is based on what the first number was. All right, so that's the basic idea that there are situations where something where um, your joint probability is to do with having two events happening one after the other and the second event is based on the first one. Um, <coughs> however, you are also often in the, in the situation uh, where you have two events that don't happen one after the other, they just happen and they're independent of each other, in which case that's more like the first situation. Okay. So they're the two different things that could happen in bivariate distribution. Right. Okay. So, um, something already happened in this calculation, which was that I considered what happened in the first one and then was thinking about the distribution of what the second number could be, given that the first one is two. Um, and that's a thing that you do in, in um, bivariate distributions, uh, where you figure that stuff out. That's called conditional probability distributions. Um, and also there's such a thing as marginal probability distributions, which is just the probability of getting, say, a one on, this, of, on the second on your card. Um, all right. OK, that's the general idea. It would be really cool if we had some examples that maybe you're worried about that I could try, like in a past exam or something. Were there anything about bivariate in it? Did your lecturer say there weren't going to be any in the exam? Okay, it's worth checking. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, was it? <laughs> So you've already got one. Okay. 
So I should just point out at least that these ones are discrete and you can do it in continuous as well, in which case there wouldn't be probabilities of individual events. It would all be density functions. Um, the other thing I want to say is that we often conceptualise this as having the options on a grid of x, y, and then the probability is interpreted as a height. So, um, just as another random example, uh, y1 and y2 have these options. Now, a six and a quarter are both the same distance from a third. So a six plus a twelfth is therefore a third. I think that adds up to one. <laughs> okay, this is random probability distribution, a discrete one. It has three um, possibilities for y1 and two possibilities for y2. Uh, the probability of getting one one is a six. The probability of getting one and two is a twelfth, and so on. I'm just going to check if this adds up to what it should. This is two twelfths. This is four twelfths. So two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, and 4 left is 12, so it does add up to 12 twelfths. So it's a valid probability distribution. <laughs> okay, so you normally interpret these as heights. I will just move my camera in a second. Taller heights, oh damn it, there we go, taller heights are um, bigger probabilities, um, yeah, so that's how you interpret it. And so I can see that um, I can add up probabilities and go, well, if I wanted to just think about what happened to y1 and ignore what was going on with y2, then combined y1 has this amount of probability to go with 1 and this amount of probability to go with 2 and this amount of probability to go with 3. And so that's called a marginal distribution where you say, well, I add up the probabilities there and just see what happens with 1, 2 and 3. Let me change the lighting. To... Aha! So those three probabilities to go with one, two, and three. Uh... Well, that's really bizarre. All right, anyway. Um, whereas on the other hand, if I wanted to figure out the probabilities of one and two um, for two, I could add them up this way. and see that 2 is way more likely than 1. And that's called a marginal distribution. Quiz and air rods for the win. OK. <coughs> now to fix my thing so that it's actually straight. There we go. OK. Well, 
a whole box just to do that, just in case that would happen. Um, okay. Uh, right. So I can say, um, basically, that the marginal So this is the joint distribution of y1 and y2. That's what this is called. The marginal distribution of y1. So these are the, prob the possibilities, one, two, three, and the probabilities are, let's see, together two-sixths, which is a third, together a third plus a twelfth, mm, would be five-twelfths, and a six plus a twelfth is a third. That doesn't make any sense. A six plus a twelfth is a quarter. third plus a quarter is seven twelfths and seven plus five is one. Okay, the things are adding up the way they should. So this one was one six plus one six and this one was one twelfth plus one third and this one was one twelfth plus one six. marginal distribution of y2 and it would make the most sense to write it as columns um, so that you're adding up this way um, but I won't so to do 1 that's a 6 plus a 12 plus a 12th Two twelfths, which is a sixth, and six, which is a third, and this ought to add up to two thirds. Yes, it would make much more sense probably to write it as columns so that it, you can imagine blooping these together to get whatever you want. Yeah. So what this is saying is that these are the probabilities of y two happening, ignoring what's going on with y one, but within that third here, there are three things that could happen to y one. Um, and they don't all have the same probability. And so I've removed all the information about what's going on with Y1, um, so I can't get that back from this information. I can only get it from here. Okay, right. And that's all well and good if you've got a table, but it may be that you've got all this, this stuff going on um, with uh, functions of distributions and stuff. And so you need to do integration or some notation to try and figure out what those marginal uh, distributions are. Okay. Oh, let me do one more. There's a conditional distribution, right? So... So I might have, for example, um, like y2 given that y1 equals 2, for example. And so I have two possibilities for what top y2 could be. So y2 could be 1 or 2. The thing is that if y1 is equal to 2, that's this situation here. So I'm just going to draw a picture. We don't want this bit or this bit. We just want this bit. 
But this is a probability, um, and the only options are one and two. So I can't put in there a twelfth and a third because um, they won't add up to one. I'm ignoring all the other possibilities, and so I need to re-assess um, them and uh, divide by, um, re-change these to be out of whatever they're out of. Uh, so a twelfth and a third together, we already figured that out. They were um, uh, up here, five twelfths. And so to figure out the right probabilities, I need to divide them. So the probability that y2 equals 1, given that y1 equals 2, is 1 twelfth divided by 5 twelfths, which is a fifth. And the probability that y2 is equal to 2, given that y1 is equal to 2, is 1 third divided by 5 twelfths, which is hopefully 4 fifths. Uh, so times top and bottom by 12, 12 divided by 3 is 4. Yep. So that's how you do conditional distributions. Right. Really makes me want to get my belt out here. I just want to just be sure of this, just a second. 1 12 and 4 12. So it was 1 twelfth and 4 twelfths, and together they are this, and that's 1 out of 5 and 4 out of 5. Yay! Awesome! Okay. Beautiful. It seems like a cool way of doing it. Multiply by the, the common denominator and then you've got the numbers as they are. Okay. So those are the ideas of conditional distributions um, and marginal distributions. So the conditional distribution um, involved division, whereas a marginal distribution involved adding things up. This of course gets harder if instead of a table like this um, with finitely many possibilities, you have either a, you know, an, a formula with infinitely many possibilities or a continuous, continuous distribution which has a whole other level of infinitely many possibilities. So you would go something like I'm so going to get this wrong, just a second. I'm going to look one up. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have f of x1, x2 is 8 times x1 times x2 for x1, x2 in some region called A, where A is this region. A 
region bounded by well let's just do a picture the x1 axis the line x1 equals 1 and the line x2 equals x1 Okay, there you go. So I could ask myself, is this a valid probability distribution? I am going to have to finish shortly. Um, and if it was valid, then when I find the probability associated with every uh, combination and I add them up, so in this case integrate them, it should come out to 1. So the thing is that this is not a picture of the probability. The probability is a function which is above this, which isn't here. Okay, the prob each of these things has a height, and when I add up those heights it comes out to whatever it comes out to. So um, here, and that would be the 1, so here it's uh, 1 times 1, so it's a height 1 here. And over here it's 0 times 1, so it's zero, height 0 here. And here it's a half and a half, so it's at a quarter. So it sort of gets higher as it goes up here. So there's more area um, closer to the top than there is at the bottom. So something like... Um, it's going to be very bad drawing. Something like that. Plato has the advantage that it sticks to the page. It's supposed to be curved though. I think it's um, thinner at the bottom than it is at the top. Okay. So that's the idea um, of what the probability density function looks like. Um, and if I wanted to do a uh, marginal distribution, then what I'd actually be doing is I would be um, adding up this area and then squashing all this together to the bottom and there would be more of it at this end than there is at this end. And if I wanted to do a conditional distribution, um, I would be slicing it here and looking at the shape of the curve there, uh, but I would need to multiply it or divide it, by some, well, divide it by something so that it adds up to one instead of what it actually adds up to. Right. Okay. So is it valid? Well, if it was valid, then the integral over the entire zone um, would um, be 1. The integral over the, well, I guess it's a double integral, over the entire region A of A x1, x2. Should be 1. But my question is, how am I going to do that integral? Because um, it changes, you know, with the options for x2 depend on the options for x1. So the best way to do it is to think about choosing an option for one axis, and then once you've got that, going up and down the other one. So I'm going to go like this. So I'm going to pick... I'm going to do it as vertical lines, which are changing length vertical lines. And so I'm going to pick my value for x1, and then if that is x1, then this will be x1 as well. And so I'm going to actually have the integral... Sorry. I'm going to do it this way around. My x1 is going to go from 0 to 1. These are the options for my x1. And once I've chosen my x1, my x2 is going to go from 0 to x1. like that. So the outside one was chosen first to locate where my line is and then the inside one is where I am on that line. Okay. 
So I'm going to do this inside integral. Uh, and it's going to go from x2 equals 0 to x2 equals 1. And in this integral, the x1 counts as a constant uh, because uh, I'm not moving that as I go up and down this line. And so uh, the x1 will still be there. The x2 will go up to squared and become halved because that's how you do integration. Should not be a power. So four x one x one squared minus four x one times zero squared. That's what that inside integral turns out to be. I am always careful to explicitly sub in the zero because sometimes it doesn't come out as zero when that end is zero. And so I explicitly sub it in just in case. It's working out nicely. So now it's just an ordinary integral and I can do it in an ordinary way. So the four is still there, the x1 goes up to power of four from zero to one. And so I've got now 4 from 0 to 1. And so that is um, 1 to the 4 minus 0 to the 4, which is 1 as it should be. So yes, it is a valid distribution. Classic uh, assignment questions is actually to put like a letter K in this position here and ask you, what does K have to be in order for it to be a valid probability distribution? And so what you'd end up doing is you'd figure it all out and you'd end up with the with like a 1 over k in this position or something. Um, and you'd end up with like, you know, in this case, k over 8 or something. Um, and then you'd go, ah, oh, right, well, k has to be 8 for it to work out to be 1. So that's what you would normally do in that way. All right. I'm going to keep going until my time runs out. Um, so um, is it valid? Sure. And then we can actually start asking probability questions. So what's the probability of having x1 and x2 in some sort of area, um, or you could also say, uh, what's the marginal distribution of x1? So in which case, right, well let's think about the marginal distribution of x1, let's do the marginal distribution of x2, actually. Marginal distrib distribution of x2 uh, would be um, thinking about all of the options that x2 can have and figuring out a probability for each option. And so I'm going to think about I'm going to go, okay, so what I want to do is I want to think about all the things that x2 could possibly be and I want to um, add up all the probabilities that go with those events um, and so given a specific value of x2 I would be adding up probabilities this way. So it would seem that the probability function it has to be a density rather than a probability that goes with um, a specific value of x2 would be adding up along this horizontal line. So we'd run across all the possible values of x1. All right. And given that this is x2 here, the matching value of x1 is also x2 because that's y equals x. And so it's going to go from x2 up until 1. Like that. Remember that the actual probabilities are not drawn in this diagram. They are above this diagram. I mean the air above the page or in the Play-Doh above the page. Um, and so when I put my Play-Doh back, I'm going to be mushing, so that that's, say, my original probability distribution. I'm actually going to be mushing this all against that axis there, well, actually over here, and trying to see what 
that probability distribution is. That's what I'm doing. So that's how I do this here. So for each line here, I'm, I add up all of the probabilities that go with that. Uh, so let's see, it's dx1, the x2 counts as a constant, um, and so it will still be there. And the 8 counts as a constant. I'm just being explicit here that it's x1 that has to be equal to x2 when I sub this in because that was the variable that I integrated. It's very easy to accidentally sub your things into the wrong thing. So just be careful with that. And so let's see. So 8x2, uh, I might just simplify that a um, tiniest bit. So let's see, we have 4x2 and the x1 is x is 1 at the top and then we have 4x2 and then the x1 is x2 at the bottom and so I have 4x2 minus 4x2 cubed and that is the proper marginal distribution of x2. So regardless of what x1 is, that's what the function that describes the probabilities of the x2. So if this was a valid probability distribution, if I integrate this across the possible values of x2, it should come out to 1. So I'm just going to check. So if I go across all the values of x2, should be 1. <coughs> okay. So for half of x2 squared minus 4 times a quarter of x2 to the 4 from 0 to 1 the light's flashing it's going to stop in a moment so I've got 2 times 1 squared minus 1 to the 4 minus 2 times 0 squared minus 0 to the 4 which is 2 minus 1 which is 1 yes it's working fine Okay, that's as much as I can fit um, in this time. I do have some other examples um, in the existing revision seminar from 2016 if you're interested. Cool, thank you.